Hello! Hi there. Welcome to Microbiology Journal Club, where you learn how big about all things small. My name is Danny. In a previous life, I dropped out from my PhD in microbiology at the University of Chicago, where I was infecting skin I grew with MRSA. Then I was a fact checker for Pharma School Advertisers, and nowadays I'm a member and the president of Biotech Without Borders, a nonprofit based at NYC, dedicated to the public with the tools of biotech. My name is Faz. I have a PhD in microbiology. I've mostly worked on bacteria, but I've also worked as a research integrity specialist, and I'm currently working as an editor for a scientific journal. Every week we meet to talk about microbiology, and today we're doing an overview of some of the coolest microbiology papers that we've seen during the week. And at the end of the month, uh, we'll, be select, we'll be choosing a paper to share on a deep dive, so make sure to mention such messages at microtwc if something has caught your fancy. Yep, uh, you can follow along with any of the papers we discuss on either week in our shared Zotero library linked in the doobly-doo below. And we want to hear from you, so please use the comments or tweet us at microtwjc. And boy, do we have a show for you today. Uh, first, what can Suez tell us about the next SARS-CoV-2 outbreak? Uh, we also get some new, more insight into what SARS-CoV-2 is doing in the brain. And then we look into uh, how not all mRNA vaccines behave in the same way. Uh, we tend to think like they're going to work the same, but what if they're not? Uh, we also look at the question of what the next versions of the RNA vaccines are going to look mm -hmm. like. Uh, what will the future ones look like down the pipeline? Then we've got a look at how amoeba team up to eat bacteria, how giant viruses are made, and how phages use, use host communications against them. And we look at a synthetic mucus. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, so to kick it off, we're always starting with a bit of SARS-CoV-2 news. Um, this is something that I, I, I'm not sure if we've ever talked about before, but undoubtedly folks have seen it on the news. It's like detection of SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater samples. Um, and this one dives into actually trying to not just look at SARS-CoV-2 levels, but distinguish between the variants uh, within those samples. And so I hadn't read any of these um, I mean, it, it, it's sort of like a discussion of the methods that they use, but as well um, the difficulty in uh, trying to figure out what the um, variants are inside of the wastewater. Because like, if you think about it, variants have like multiple mutations, but inside of a wastewater sample, they're, everything's mixed together. <laughs> and uh, right. like DNA could be like degraded in different ways and stuff like that. So um, just if you like, not every mutation that you find is going to be part of the same organism, right? Um, like, how do you get all those different relative levels? <laughs> right, I see. So if you could say got an outbreak of that's got mixed between Delta and say uh, Omicron, yeah. some of them have, they have some mutations in common. Mm -hmm. So you might not be able to tell whether there's like just Delta or just Omicron yeah. or like what level of mixture there is. Exactly. Like there just has to be a lot of planning in place that you like, you have, I guess you need those full genomes to know like what the most salient features are you want to amplify out of this RNA mixes. Um, yeah. And that's, that's basically the challenges that they faced in, in uh, being able to distinguish these things in their samples. Um, and they, they, they're able to, <laughs> to successfully disambiguate uh, the presence of several different um, several different variants within a wastewater sample. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah. I mean that's really really interesting mm -hmm. uh, because one of the thoughts was like if I mean discovering a new variant in wastewater samples must mean that, that there must come with a lot of skepticism because Definitely. you find a new variant and you've seen like those mutation four, then you might be tempted to say, well actually this is probably a mixture of different variants yeah so yeah i definitely this is not yeah i don't think it, it would be easy <laughs> to find a new variant within wastewater but perhaps uh, yeah given the right given the proper genomic context outside of that there like you'd be able to at least discuss like uh track down the variants that were inside mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and i think this paper does give a nice like background into how to kind of go about that as well yes. so looking at yeah mm -hmm. So yeah, it's quite quite interesting, and also like that that these sorts of things are detected in the wastewater, and what and now we see like a decline in overall testing. Uh, this might be yeah like a way to it's, hear uh, get an warning sign about it <laughs> if something bad's happening. It's true. I mean that that is what people say. Yeah, I guess this is a good graph. Just like regularly, this is the end result of what they're able. Mm. I think they, these are the clinical cases they have. And then uh, the the graph above it is like 
the wastewater signal that they're getting. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I think that like that is that is the hope is that like it would serve as a way of getting around testing everybody. But I mean, testing everybody is the better. But when again, like with this idea of new variants, the we're gonna want to find those as like whole viruses, not as mm. fragments of viruses, because we don't know like what strange chimeras or whatever exist. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, completely. Um, so I think that's all we have to say on that paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so very quick. Uh, next paper, neuropathology and virus in the brain of SARS-CoV-2 infected non-human primates. Oh, uh, yeah. Poor, poor monkeys <laughs> uh, being infected with SARS-CoV-2. But of course, there's a reason, and uh, right, like uh, an, a review board that, that, that um, tried to... Um, interrogate whether that reason was good and and the reason here is you know it's clear now that SARS-CoV-2 has a whole bunch of neurological symptoms especially ones that may have long-term effects and um, they want the the investigators of this paper are, are searching for a model uh, to be able to see <laughs> uh, to, to, yeah, yeah, to be able to see some neuropathology uh, within within brains uh, that might be relevant in order to study that disease process. Um, so they use a mixture of rhesus macaques and wild-caught African green monkeys in this, Ooh, in okay. this study. Yeah. Um, and they give them two different um, routes of infection. They do the, the classic all mucous membranes uh, route. Uh, so yeah. that's the one where they're just trying to get it in, but they also do maybe a more physiological, like um, aerosolized version. Um, mm. And the authors report the same results. They don't see any significant difference actually in the results they, that they report here between those two groups. Um, so yeah. <laughs> that's I guess, I, that's actually kind of a good thing, right? To like just about the routes of infection, at least as it comes to this particular mm. phenotype. Yeah, yeah, I think it's good to have. Well, thing thing is like it's long COVID. It, there are lots of neurological symptoms, and it's very hard to replicate those in animals that don't have the high level cognition that humans do. And so, right, and that's right. Weird. But they in don't this in this in this paper though. They they don't look at um, like that those more complex behavioral things like they're just looking at the autopsy tissues at least in my browsing i didn't see like them pick out like any you know erratic behavior or like stuff like that those types of assays um they they really focus just on the on the histology i guess mm -hmm. of yeah of these brains so yeah like the image that you popped up right now i think they're looking at like some hemorrhaging or something like this like right um some yeah. cell death kind of issues that they're seeing in in the in the brain. Um, so yeah, yeah. So getting like all the kind of like characterizing what kind of damage the SARS-CoV-2 is doing to the brain, and mm -hmm. that the, <clears throat> and hopefully we'd be able to see maybe something similar in humans, and then we'd be able to correlate and see what what's going on. Absolutely, yeah. I think that that is that's the that's the hope for for this data where where it'll end up going. Yeah, let's see what the pictures that you picked out A to, yeah, looking at cell death in these certain re different regions of the brain. Um, they do they do mention that they don't see um, they don't see a lot of uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the cerebral spinal fluid or stuff like that. So it's they, it's not that they see like tons of virus replicating in the brain or like right like viruses haven't like overtaken your brain in this sense. Um, like, I think we've talked about this before. It's primarily through the endothelial, like, right, the, the blood, the blood supply, mm -hmm. um, and like ACE2 is expressed on those endothelial cells. So, um, yeah, there, it's able to cause some inflammation and that ends up causing these like small micro hemorrhages, uh, within, within brain tissue. Um, and of course, like in the in the right regions, right, like, or the wrong regions, I guess, those hemorrhages are gonna cause, right, would be hypothesized to cause a whole a range of negative neuro neurological symptoms. <clears throat> um, yeah, yeah. I, what, what else do I wanna say? I think, oh, the monkeys are older in this, in this model. Right. They are using like an older monkey, um, I guess, because, you know, as we all age, like um, our tissues are not as robust against certain types of damage. So like, I think that one of the thoughts here, right, is that there is like, um, yeah, like 
older older tissues that that's how they're that's how they're getting this reproducible um, uh, damage that they're seeing. Um, but of course, like that that doesn't necessarily correlate to like our case. Again, they're they're really just trying to target. I think like something they can um, sink their teeth into and right some sort of phenotype that they can start to dissect. Um, yeah, that's I. I think everything that I want to say about this, unless you had any other thoughts. No, I think that that's uh, pretty much what I'd have wanted to say as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we can mm -hmm. move on to the next paper then, which is um, um, mRNA-1273 and BNT-162b2 COVID-19 vaccines elicit antibodies with differences in the FC-mediated effect functions. Mm. So, yeah, this is an interesting paper for, for multiple reasons you can get into. But usually when you talk about mRNA vaccines, we tend to lump them together. So I think we've looked at a number of studies over the past uh, few weeks where you they compared just the, both mRNA vaccines to, uh, to other vaccines as if they're one kind of whole. <laughs> yep. But this study kind of looks and in, interrogates that a bit more. Um, so they, they, what they found was that... Uh, that, that maybe for the original kind of uh, D614G, mm -hmm. they, these uh, vaccines produce very similar responses. But for the other variants, there seem to be like differences emerging uh, in how how the vaccines respond, how, mm -hmm. how well they're doing against them. Yeah. Uh, so it, in this study, they looked at a number of participants and then tried to characterize the FC immediate effective responses. So usually when we look at antibody responses, it's very crude. We look at whether they either neutralize or bind. Yeah. But obviously, antibodies do a lot more stuff than that. They signal to the rest of the immune system and to like things like T cells, to the complement system, to kind of bring a response together. Mm -hmm. And the theory here is that the, these and vaccines... I just want to say, like, and that, and that signaling to the immune system, one of the ways that it's accomplished is like through that is through the FC region, yes, right? Exactly. So like you have antibodies, they have that stereotypical Y shape where the two ends of the Y, that's the stuff that's recognizing those antigens. And then the stem of the Y, that's the constant region. And so our immune system can recognize that constant region and presumably in like different contexts, right? Then initiate a variety of actions. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, they use a number of like techniques to try and find because a lot of these things they find, like when they look at individual criteria, they're very similar. But when they like, they do this kind of layout algorithm, I think, where they, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's like principal component analysis, where they try to like characterize and find out where the differences are. And uh, I think they find some differences in the way that, say, they do antibody, like, uh, see, uh, oh, okay, right. so mRNA, yeah. Uh, so I've, I mean, uh, so they found that, say, uh, uh, there's some things that are enhanced in the mRNA-1273. So in the Moderna vaccine, there's more RBD-specific IgA1 and IgG2, uh, as well as nucleotide-dependent uh, areas. So uh, I think the, the, the idea is that, like, uh, so, some of the responses are more geared to, say, the ribosome binding domain, mm -hmm. which is both good because that's a very active domain, but also... That's where lots of mutations happen. So, some in some areas, variants might be able to evade some of the mRNA vaccines more often. Not just not through simply a way. I think I think the way that some uh, the FC responses are, are triggered means that they're geared in a way that will be different. Yeah, I mean, um, it's uh, so like the a lot of the assays that we've seen with uh, with vaccines have just looked at neutralization. Right, that's like one specific yes. endpoint <laughs> with with antibodies, and though the in in that context of that assay, the the antibodies that bind the receptor binding domain are going to be the the main drivers mm -hmm. of of that phenotype, right? Like they're the because they're disrupting the binding, right? Which means they disrupt the ability for that virus to then enter enter the cell but then yeah the assays they're using here they have antibody dependent complement deposition antibody dependent cellular phagocytosis antibody dependent neutrophil phagocytosis and antibody dependent nk cell activation so like there's all these other things that um that we can evaluate antibodies as doing and like you have to i think the thing to remember here is that vaccines that yeah, vaccines elicit a, a polyclonal antibody response. It's mm -hmm. not just like you make one antibody right to the vaccine. 
your body makes a whole bunch of them. And, uh, you know, we've talked about this before, like it's a very, um, <laughs> immune system's very complicated. So like all those weird, there's like strange, small contextual things that probably like set off the antibody response in a lot of different directions. We don't fully understand how to control those things yet, but this paper is telling us that there are some differences <laughs> in like sort of the end results of the anti, but the polyclonal antibody cocktail. <laughs> yeah, which is like interesting because like that can we can learn a lot from those kinds of differences and try and figure out how to make better vaccines because the uh, the ability to have this kind of subtle control over the immune response is really interesting. Mm -hmm. if, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so if we were to understand what was the cause of this, then that could lead us to have, find, to be able to construct better vaccines. Yeah, but, which is like, I feel yeah. like last two weeks ago, we were like really excited when they compared right all the four different vaccine modalities against each other. And like the thing that we were excited about was like, oh, we're learning so much about like how vaccines work <laughs> yeah, in, this, yeah. in this example. And in many ways, I feel like this paper is giving us that same insight because they're comparing these two kind of similar vaccines and but they're finding these differences so we're like oh we're learning about like that, how vaccines work in relation to the immune system <laughs> yeah and of course like i think as a part of this paper this is also interesting because that paper used only one kind of mr i think that, it, that, that was a paper that pulled both mrna vaccines together yeah but mm -hmm. this is like drilling down even further to find out yeah. more details <laughs> and obviously whenever i see a paper like this that uh, ends up like saying that one vaccine is better than the other i check the the like um I checked it again to see yeah. <laughs> who's paying for it. Like, is it like who's paying it for it? Is it? I mean, turns out some of the people were taking money from Pfizer, which means they take money to trash their own vaccine, which is interesting. But the main thing that stood out to me was that it's also funded by SpaceX, which was weird. I was like, why does SpaceX fund this? Turns out one of the authors is Elon Musk. No way. Yeah. An I, oh, that's I, that's so bizarre. Yeah. Elon as Musk. like a. As, Oh, it's like an investigator. Uh, I mean, no, no, anyways. Yeah, like, apparently I don't get into some like... data acquisition for them. So, uh, awesome the contributions. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, I can just I imagine like kind of, I mean, the author contribution statement like has what he has done written in it. Um, I think all scientists have to write what they've done, just so you don't have like gift authorship or things like that. And yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so he helped the text. <laughs> Yeah, so he he helped with this. So yeah, vaccines to the moon. I think is that the, how the meme goes? Yes, I presume so. <laughs> um, I I did want to say like in the last what I found kind of fascinating or like maybe a nice way of helping people conceptualize like the difference between right the neutralizing ability and these other abilities is that in the final figure of this paper they compare uh, all the different vaccines that they have. Um, oh, yeah, I think it's in this one. Oh, my gosh, yeah, sorry. I'm like, the oh, yeah, uh, this is, yeah, infection with people just got like... Uh... With people with normal infection, right? So it's a really big graph, right? They have mm -hmm. across the top, they have um, right the, the different types of infection that you could have gotten. And then, or, oh, my gosh, it's too tiny to see. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll see if I can get better. I'm trying to zoom in on my PDF too, but it's like, uh, I'll, I'll get there. <laughs> yeah, so, take a moment. Got like, so, um, they, so they're doing looking at so you, Yeah, so you got the two different, yeah, two different vaccines, two different vaccines plus regular infection, right, are the three columns at the top. Mm -hmm. And then going down, that's all the different variants that they're testing. They have all the different variants of the spike protein. Um, and, then, and then they look, at, they look at the antibodies that come back, the, the two points in each graph. One is like the antibody cocktail as is that is developed um, that comes from patients that are immunized, right, with those different vaccines. And then the other one is that same antibody cocktail, but depleted for the receptor binding domain. <laughs> right. So yeah, this is very so, clever. Yeah. So that means that like there are still antibodies, right? So they use like a, I guess they have like a little like, fishing um, receptor binding domain that they like treat all of the antibodies that come off of these convalescent patients, uh, immunized or convalescent patients, uh, that still leaves some antibodies left over, right? Like not all antibodies are going to be directed to that binding surface. And so in this way, they're able to see like the different relative effects, right, of um, or the different like, I guess, it's a very gross measure of like the, the antibodies that are left over <laughs> in these different cases. 
Um, so, and, and they do see differences, right? This is like where they see some of the differences between the two vaccines yeah. is that like they have a different propensity to create um, like the non-receptor binding domain antibodies. Um, yeah. But it's not like, it's also really messy. <laughs> it's very subtle. <laughs> right, it's like, a very subtle difference. Yeah. Um, it's a very subtle difference because there's also a lot of difference just in individuals, right? Like the way an individual reacts to a vaccine might be different. And maybe some of times those differences are enough to compensate for the differences between the vaccines themselves. And so like, yeah, it's um, that I just thought that I want to I want to point this part of the figure out because um, it's kind of a very simple intervention, right? Experimental condition, deplete all the receptor binding domains and see what happens uh, in a readout that it kind of, it's the readout we've been looking at all this time, right? Do the, do the antibodies then bind well to, to all these different variants? Yeah, I mean, it goes back to what we were saying about the receptor binding domain being an area of high mutation. And so mm -hmm. like having like antibodies that re react to the broad length of the spike is thought that that will mean it's more like robust against new variants because yep. like, yep. so I think that's what, how they're explaining how the Moderna vaccine might be doing slightly better th against new variants because mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then of course, like the, the million dollar or, you know, who knows, like several billion dollar question, right? Would be like, like why, yeah. like, why are those, right? How, how do we then take those lessons and like make sure that every vaccine we make, right? Is going to be able to capture like, yeah, these different functions. So then in the, sorry, just zooming out like this panel of figures. So they repeat that over and over again for for different assays. So all those different antibody dependent yeah. X, Y, and Z functions. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's like there's like complement recruitment. There's like activating mm -hmm. NK cells. There's like mm -hmm. activating CD cell, uh, the cytotoxic T cells. There's like a, a lot of stuff that is going on here. Yeah, and and and, and yeah. then contextualize that for like all the other graphs we've seen before typically like we just see like one of these right and that would be for neutralization <laughs> was the assay right but like here yeah. this paper is about like all these other assays that antibodies can do yeah okay yeah and i think we're finding that how it's that's a, an important function that gets ignored and i think that that like uh because we often look at neutral antibody neutralization as like the gold standard but it might not be and we might be be like thinking that our vaccines are doing worse than they actually are because if we just focus on that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like because they were using antibody neutralization as such like an early like screen, right, to see if vaccines would progress to the next level, right, that it, it could be that some of these assays would be really useful in that context too, or at least like not, not to rely on just a single assay, right, to make that decision and use like a bunch of different assays. We could find, right, good vaccines that we weren't thinking of as good vaccines before because we were blinded in saying like just neutralization. <laughs> yeah, completely. So a great paper from various like researchers, including Elon Musk. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to put, I don't want to talk him up necessarily, but I mean, again, at the same time, like, uh, you know, sure if any Elon Musk fans want to like send a lot of like attention our way, we're like, we're happy to have the attention. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Send, send Bitcoin, please. Um, <laughs> <Send> Bitcoin, please. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, next uh, one, specific <laughs> replicating RNA vaccines protect from disease following challenge with heterologous variants of concern. So this is another uh, look at uh, mRNA vaccines versus variants of concern. And this is looking mm -hmm. at like a different mRNA vaccine strategy. So um, uh, this is looking at self-replicating RNA vaccines. So these are vaccines. Mm -hmm. So Usually in the uh, Moderna or Pfizer, they give you like a set a length of like mRNA sort of like mm -hmm. a, a mRNA vaccine that goes in and that gets tra transcribed and eventually that gets degraded and you've got your cell producing virus. But what this one does is it these allow for the mRNA to be injected and then once it gets inside the cells, it replicates and so the, those cells will end up producing more of the like protein version of the vaccine more yeah. for a lot longer yeah. Tr translate and translate it right that, like it's be, the the yeah. yeah in the in the original original form i don't know in the form that most of us are many of us have gotten in our arms right that those mrnas get translated a few times or however many times but then they get degraded yeah. here yeah there's some mechanism to replicate them what, what is 
what, what does that reckon? So what they do is they take the length of of you got your the your, your RNA sequence a, a gene that creates a a, a polymerase. So, mm. so they use like an alpha virus based uh, RNA vaccine. So it's got like a I think it's got like a polymerase from down to the front of the spike gene. So when yeah, this gets yeah. translated, it also gets trans translates the protein that allows the RNA to self-replicate. Yeah, an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. <laughs> yes. So rna so, Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like a reconstituted minimal RNA virus in the sense, right? So like, yeah. we, like in the adenovirus, right? It, in some ways it has um, like this kind of similarity when we think about like the adenoviral vaccines, right? You're making DNA that makes a bunch of copies of our mRNA, but here, like, let's like remove the DNA part, which might be good, like, because of the splicing, right? The spli extra right. splicing yeah. design care, like, we kind of covered that a little while back. That there's some additional design concerns that we want to incorporate when we're making DNA-based uh, vaccines. Um, yeah, and bypassing that by using an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. <laughs> yeah. So effectively, this kind of yeah, you're right. It mimics that virus infection and. That, and part of that, I think they they theorize that because it does that, it can do more to promote the immune response because mm. it's mm. because it's simulating a virus infection much better. It was more likely to activate the tool like receptors and uh, uh, retinoic acid like inducible genes, so Rig ones to sure. uh, produce interferons and in inflammatory factors to help like let the immune system know that this is indeed a virus and it's replicating in this sort of way. So it needs to they need to create an appropriate immune response. Yeah, well, I mean, so, this system would create double-stranded RNA as one of its byproducts. Yeah. Yeah, so, like, that's something Which that... Which is a big, like... Big signal. Yeah, yeah big signal. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and they create uh, a number of different, like, variants of the R this RNA vaccine. So they've got... So they create a version with the A1 strain, with the B1 strain, B117, mm -hmm. and B1351. So, like, uh, I'm, uh, I can't... The, the, these have now got so many different names now. It's like I'm reading Anna Karenina. Yeah. Um, so the alpha, the beta, uh, and I don't uh, I don't recall what the regular name Wuhan virus variant. Uh -huh. <laughs> so yeah, uh, and they they test test them out to see which ones respond to each other the best. So I think they find that that tends to be like the 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 vir the vaccines are best for the viruses that they were like imprinted off but some of the vaccines are better yeah. than others at being broad broader um mm -hmm. i think like one thing we've taken from and this and this is in mice right yeah, there, this, this is, is in, like some in some mice and hamsters so they and they, they test oh hamsters yeah. yeah actually no hamsters are very good yeah so they test it in non-humanized mice so the mice that get SARS-CoV-2 but don't get sick from it so that they're, they're mostly to characterize what the immune response was from and then the hamsters were for mm -hmm. challenge studies to see who would who would survive based on the vaccine Gotcha. <clears throat> so, and they found like, yeah, things like vaccine in like was really good at reducing viral stretch shedding. And I think what they came to the conclusion was that I think um, uh, the B117 mice would mice would do a B117 vaccine had like quite good broad uh, pr protectiveness for a lot of these strains. And is is B117 is that beta or is that the ancestral? That's alpha. <laughs> so that's not so the. Oh, it's alpha. Yeah, so there's the ancestral, there's a D615G, and then B17 came was the UK strain. The UK, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> All these names. Yeah. <laughs> All these names now. I mean, <laughs> and yeah, it looks kind of promising. But the thing that was interesting for me was this paper was looking at looking how the broad, like how each response, like, sorry, how, what the, the broadness that these vaccines can cover for each one. Mm -hmm. um, which is which is something I mean, like right, it exists. The broadness also exists in the vaccines that we're currently using. It's not yeah. unique to this particular uh, this particular vaccine modality. But but reporting that information as some of the initial right studies of a certain vaccine modality does give us a sense of the possibilities for for the platform. I think I think so because usually we we kind of assume that the SS strain is probably going to get the most coverage because that's where it, all the other strains came from. Mm -hmm. But if mm -hmm. say there was another strain down the line that had that could produce that better coverage, then that's an interesting thing to, that we should test. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I I, and, I wonder how much of that is like specific for the vaccine modality as well because mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty sure we had seen 
some other study that said that like, but it is the ancestral one, right? And maybe another vaccine modality, like it said that the ancestral strain was like had yeah. the most broad coverage in terms That's of protection. Exactly <laughs> true. Um, yeah. Because again, this is a different vaccine modality. We don't know how this would translate into real because these are yeah. like, it's a self-replicating RNA. That's quite different from what we've got already. Right. Um, right. Yeah, I think that's all I need to say about this one, which brings us to the next one, which is also about our, these are about circular RNA vaccines. Uh, mm. So circular RNA vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 and emerging variants. So the thing about RNA is that it usually exists as a single strand and it gets degraded quickly when you get things like RNA uh, degradases. I can't remember <laughs> what the name was, but there are enzymes that chew on each end yeah. of the RNA uh, strand and, exo and nibble it smaller. Exonucleases. Exo Yes, yeah. exonucleases. Uh, which so the so and one thing is that RNA loss has, lots of RNA has like poly A tails which kind of hold off exonucleases because yep. they chew off this <laughs> edge of ex, bit of like useless RNA. Like a timer, and RNA <laughs> like, a, like a fuse timer at the end. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the thought here was that if we got rid of those ends and made the RNA into a circle then those exonucleases would, would have a lot of trouble breaking that down. Um, so that's the thought behind creating circular RNA vaccines. Mm. And so what they do for circular RNA, I think that they... So on each end, they've got two halves of an intron that are complementary. So the RNA will form like a ring. And because it's got like an intron splicing site, it'll trick the host like RNA put, um, kind of uh, splicing apparatus to splice out that intron fuse it together and turn it into a circular mm. RNA. <clears throat> and so they try it out in, I believe they try it in, in primates. Let me look at my notes. That's and... fascinating. No, just like the, the making of them is really interesting. Um, it's, yeah, yeah, that doesn't happen. It also is like very strange. Like I wonder, you know, just in context of what we were talking about, like the different ways in which cells see uh, molecules, uh, the immune system sees molecules and responds to it. I wonder if like these circular RNA structures like tell the cells anything, <laughs> right? Like I don't. I mean, yeah. they have some double-stranded RNA as part of them simply because of the way that they're, they're gotcha. created. <laughs> so again, so, so it, that it's hitting be... that. Yeah, it's hitting that signal inside of the cells. Yeah, they're called like uh, group one intron auto. Catalysis strategy. So, so the, these aren't these aren't naturally occurring. So they're engineered. I think in 2018, uh, they mm -hmm. created uh, an intron to to circularize rise like RNAs up to five kilobits in length. And I guess because it's can only store like a short amount of DNA, they only put in the RBD, yep. uh, which is good. But then from what we've seen from our previous study, it maybe not probably maybe limits the ver the yeah the types of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah, they, so this is an entirely new strategy. Again, this is focusing on not so much allowing the RNA to amplify, but to uh, increase its lifespan mm -hmm. so that it's expressed by the cells. Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so, like, a really cool kind of new vaccine strategy. I think that brings us to the end of our SARS CoV 2 stuff. Yes. And into um, oh, almost like uh, a, uh, yes. just watching watching <laughs> uh, single celled organisms in plates <laughs> and seeing what happens. Uh, the cellular slime mold Fonticula alba forms a dynamic multicellular collective while feeding on bacteria. So um, so yeah, amoeba are uh, eukaryotic eukaryotes, uh, and they often eat. Uh, other single cell things and in this case they graze on they graze on bacteria and so you know just watching a species growing and grazing uh, you learn a bunch of things because they're pretty complicated they have a lot of different behaviors um, there's a classic model organism dictostelium uh, uh, that that amoeba we know it forms like slugs Mm -hmm. uh, that graze the surface, and then when um, starvation happens, they form stalks and they spread out. So uh, here's just another amoeba in a similar family. Do they put? Are they oh, show yeah, you your, this is it's, a... it's in the same group as Dictostelium. 
It's Dixus, I think, is the die carrier, maybe? I'm, I actually don't remember so, where that one goes. Yeah, this is the, the part that you carry, and like, I think they're called, mm-hmm. called uh, Ops, op, Opis, co, Opis Thocons, uh, which mm. are groups that you carry, which include, include amoeba, fungi, and animals, and us. Yeah. So, <laughs> a fa- so, so this is kind of looking at the roots of multicellularity in the in our group. So at some point, fungi and animals diverged off, and looking at like how and looking at these amoeba can kind of tell us a bit about how that happened. And so these amoeba are kind of more related to fungi. Mm-hmm. So the idea is that looking at how these amoeba can go from like a single cellular kind of vibe to working together can tell us a bit about fungal evolution. Yeah, it, it provides like a potential hypothesis on like how multicellularity might have evolved in, in fungi. And, and I think the one thing we'll say is that um, multicellularity, it's thought, a, a hypothesis out there is that multicellularity has evolved many times within like the group in, in these groups so like we're seeing one example like uh in in this particular organism we may be seeing one example but like that that just gives us um an idea of how it might have happened it could have happened very differently for fungi and also if we look at other amoeba it may happen differently still um but here yeah so like the way that they're going to get at this is they look at this feeding behavior so this is like on a lawn of bacteria so just covered in bacteria they release a bunch of these amoeba and they see that they move in groups it's not just like single amoeba going out and like spreading all across like they have these pathways that they're going through um they have like a follow the leader style (laughs) um uh motion (laughs) yeah that's something i found very interesting about it, the the idea that there is just a leading like uh, amoeba mm-hmm. that's just in front, and then somehow it's hooking and leading all the other ones around. Yep. Um, <laughs> so in in Dictostelium, sorry, I like I enjoy this Dictostelium organism. So I've read a bit about their behavior before. In Dictostelium, like this feeding behavior, like they aggregate into like a giant slug that moves. So yes. there is still like a leader type thing, but it's more like a unit. But here in this in this particular amoeba, it seems like they're like spreading. It's kind of like a network, right? Where like they all they all connect back to the source or whatever. But like, yeah, they have like sort of multiple tendrils that are going out into the front. <clears throat> yeah, uh, and yeah, there's, there's yeah, it, is, it does get fascinating because like then you can see like what their behavior is like on their own. Uh, mm-hmm. So because uh, <laughs> they often because they tend to start off as spores. And uh, there's all sorts of like fascinating. I and mean, this this paper has got lots of great videos, and I would yeah. recommend people taking the time to look at that because <laughs> this is very much like there are some like uh, amazing like shots. So this this one is like a pan out of the entire pet petri dish where they scan to look at like the where the dick where the uh, not dick ceiling, but where the this uh, is feeding, and then yeah. the inner part where it starts to form spores. Just like what, what Danny was mentioning about dexelium, where when so when there's less nutrients, they just go ahead and form these like kind of big like spores, which aren't on screen yet, but I promise you that they will be coming soon. Um, I was... <laughs> yeah, it's panning all the way across, and the idea is that like it started from like what we saw on the left hand side. That's like the front, the beginning of the the collective like going into the lawn. But like as we move to the right, like these. Um, amoeba have been have been grazing the lawn for a long time, and yeah. so they're depleting the bacterial food source there. And as they deplete that food source, then they start becoming structures. Yeah, so some of these are like the structures now, right? <laughs> yeah, and uh, something they found ways to like kind of s- disrupt the lead the leader behavior. So I think they used the words they used. They they tickled them with uh, <laughs> a laser, with, like lights. <laughs> Or something to get to get them to disrupt. So you see, like in in here, they they flash some light. So instead of having one leader, it's they start to like get confused. And but after a while, they f- pick a new like w- version, a new mm-hmm. like kind of uh, I, I, alga to lead. I keep forgetting the name <laughs> Am- of this amoeba? organism. Uh, An amoeba. They're... Amoeba. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the organism is um, Fonticula. Fonticula alba. Fonticula. <laughs> yeah. I mean. Uh, my favorite video is this one where you can they you can see like this first wave of of fonticula going yes. out and then like almost crashing against the, each other this is and uh, all in the background you also see the the kind of the cyst turn to spores yep. 
So the, yeah, the other it's... interesting part, so yeah, like you can get a sense of this paper is like a lot of just watching, <laughs> watching plates of, of this amoeba, like go through the, the go through uh, lawns of bacteria and trying to understand like through microscopy and through small interventions, right? What's underpinning this, this behavior. Um, the, another behavior that they talk about is in starvation, there's a mixture of stalks and cysts that get formed. So stalks are um, an, another sort of organizational structure that happens where the amoeba like band together and they make they make a stalk which has like a sporozyte on the top. So that allows them, it gives them some height off the dish. That's so you can kind of see them. They're kind of, yeah, like popped up. Um, yeah, in like a, when you're looking at them down, right, they get denser in this way. Um, so yeah, playing the video again, you can see these kind of sp spores like pop up and get, yeah, and get that, that yeah, sweet yeah, yeah, air. yeah. So that's like they're getting starved in that area, right? So like they no longer have the they, because the wave has gone through and they've eaten all the bacteria, they they they're now switching to a different life cycle, hopefully to disperse themselves to a larger distance. Um, but some of, something that they noticed in this band as well is that not only do these guys make stocks, but they also, some of them just insist. Uh, so like they don't, so those ones, uh, the idea is that maybe they're hedging their bets on two strategies. One strategy is dispersal, that's the stocks. And the other one is kind of just like uh, endur enduring the starvation, right, which is the cyst. So that maybe if bacteria come back, the cyst will open up and then they'll have another amoeba. But if bacteria never come back, then the stocks will hopefully have dispersed the, the their sporozoites or whatever. I'm, I'm not sure what the babies are called, um, but like it, it, into a larger into a larger radius. <laughs> yeah, and they characterize like when they're on their own, they have like two different papers. So there's like an A where they sit around and just like gobble bacteria that are near them, mm -hmm. like kind of like reaching out. And then in B where they just what actually wander around and start like hunting things on their own. Um, right. Yeah, so those yeah. Oh, those that... polarities are important because I think the part of the observations that they make is that you have to be one of those polarity um, um, amoeba in order to begin the leader follower type behavior. Yeah. <sighs> and there's some really cool thing they do about these food deserts they call where they create food deserts on on the plate plate where like there isn't much like nutrients. Let's see. Yes. Oh, here. So you yes. see like. The, they the each of these little like bands go out and some just, like immediately go back the moment they sense there's no food and others just take the risk and r run out and they become like more flatter uh -huh. <laughs> and then and so when they're like in this they go out and they become flatter and they they wander out and then in B you see them from this this area of food desert going into a new bacterial lawn and then changing right back into that like bunched up predatory kind of formation. Yep. Yeah, so it really, it, it, in some ways, it's very interesting to see the population. Not everyone, like, even with this leader follower of behavior, there's, there's still some sort of collective behavior that's happening that can fragment, right? That uh, it, they're, not, they're not bound to the fate of just following the tendrils. And if the tendril decides to turn back, there, there's actually some that could split off, right? And, and maybe explore new environments. So there's all this, I think there's a lot of interesting things to be said about, like, the strategies at play here like what environments uh does this particular suite of behaviors uh help um these organisms uh yeah explore and of course like they must be somewhat successful because uh yeah they have it encoded in their genomes presumably right this this way of integrating with uh with the different stimuli stimuli that they encounter and finally they do this other cool thing where they put it face to face with dictostilium they have like a, a competition <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to see who will win. Uh, yeah, we... I don't know if there's a video of that, but they, I think they, they kind of characterize that in certain situations, the, this method where the you get like lines of like waves of uh, F alba yep. running out and kind of outpacing Dictyostelium much faster. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, that's in some ways it, it's embedded in that very, I, you know, I think it's a cute thing that they pace them off together. Like, I don't know what the natural history reasoning would be behind that, but like uh, it, it definitely proves a point that this branching method of, of forging as a collective, it has this advantage of covering lots of 
lots of land, <laughs> lots of space. And you, you can start, um, I guess, supporting like a large cell population better across like a large surface than um, Dictostelium, which is going to make a slug, which I guess isn't as branchy. And it's like more like a, yeah, like a, like a single, I don't know, like, I want to say like a tour bus, a tour bus that's going to all the buffets versus like open the doors of the tour bus, let all the people like swarm the mall and, and eat wherever they want. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so this is a yeah, this is a, a really fun paper to read, and yeah, I do get. I mean, some of the images do give me this like David Attenborough en energy of like, and here we see the yeah. The I, I think that that's what it is. This is yeah. This is the the this is the analogy like where you can have just you can have really cool like almost macro level behaviors that happen with certain protists because they they do communicate with each other. And and they're in and it's kind of evident when you watch them that they're integrating uh, this data from like their surroundings as well as from their compatriots. <laughs> yeah, I mean for for this I'm like getting a lot of like army ant energy from them. I don't know if you got that uh -huh. like yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> you can see them kind of almost organized in clusters and that's like yeah. Uh, I mean really army to see. army ants I think are a, a a famous example of like laying down follower leader mentality right like yeah. they lay pheromone tracks for each other and they follow them. So I mean those types of questions I think are ex the exact same questions that would could then be asked of this system, right? So like this is just the first observation, well, well published observation, right? With all of these different behaviors. So then you can like start to dig down and be like, so are there pheromones that they're leaving behind? Is it like cell contact, right? Like what, like what is the decision moment that lets them splinter at that desert point, right? Like, w like what sort of like molecular signals are going on at that fashion? Um, yeah, and like diving into those things, like who knows what we'll find, right? It's just like kind of fascinating observation-based uh, stuff that that could lead to interesting things. And of course, uh, the way that they, the, the way the authors have worked in this paper to bind it all together is with that evolutionary story, saying that because these guys are close to the fungi, and we know that fungal like morphology is like with these branching hyphae, right? They go out and they like. Um, like expand over a surface, like maybe that this, right? Maybe this is this is evidence of that, that those hyphae emerged from these types of collective behaviors that eventually they like, um, they were just, they became multicellular, but they did the same thing. <laughs> right, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think I've said all I need to say on this, but yeah, yeah. really, yeah. really fun. <laughs> Same with uh, me. Let's look at what we got next. <laughs> uh, particle morphology of a Medusa virus inside and outside the cells reveals a new maturation process for the giant viruses. So, yeah, giant viruses are really interesting because we don't really know too much about them. Uh, I think, like, generally, like, for most giant viruses, they, what they found was that when they go into society like their target, which are usually, like, I guess algae, but I'm not sure whether that's in this paper, mm -hmm. um, uh, they, they tend to create their own replication organelle. Kind of similar to what we've seen with coronavirus, and uh, yep. they, but the Medusa virus is kind of different. If it, it, instead, it doesn't seem to create that kind of medicine, that kind of replication organelle. So the question is, what is it doing? What, what is it? How are the virus bits being packaged? And what they find basically, they they do some like fancy like electron uh, cryo EM microscopy to to figure this out. So I'm gonna. Po post up some yeah it's pretty wild i feel like they get a lot of information of the structure of these particles just through em <laughs> being able to take slight right because em they're slicing uh cryo em right it's like a special structure of ice that they're using they're able to slice through and see um yeah see see a bunch of the structure they can uh, reconstruct many of those slices and make tomographs so they can even get a sense of like a little bit of the 3D structure um, that is going through the slice. Um, and they're able to learn a lot about the, yeah, the, oh yeah, here they're zooming through the stack, right? In this. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and what, what, what other things we have? We are, uh, so yeah, they, they, they zoom through the stack and they look at the different viruses, the virus particles that are being Great to tell me. Oh, whoops. Uh, I will mm -hmm. go back to the beginning. Uh, yeah. So they they get all these snapshots, and the challenge for the microscopists is, or like the biologists, I guess, in the sense is like 
um, linking together all those pictures into a story of replication, right? Because you're seeing all these things at different stages, right? You don't really know which one comes first or which comes comes second, but like based on what you know of like what's required in the process, like these are like really important clues to begin to build that story. <clears throat> yeah. So what they find is that they they look. I think they find that there are areas where the capsid are being is being produced. Mm -hmm. And areas where the DNA is being produced, because I think like the DNA is in is like covered with an envelope and is produced in the nucleus of the of its target cell, mm -hmm. and the capsid is being produced in a different area. Mm -hmm. And what what effectively happens is that uh, the the capsid gets transported to the nucleus, and there is a point where they kind of intersect. <laughs> and uh, I, me pull up because I think it's a bit clearer in the paper than it is on these fancy videos. Uh, I need to. So apologies, I am working with two keyboards to try and keep everything <laughs> square, which is... Uh, uh, let's see if I can pull is up... Is it figure 12? I mean, they, I, I, I see a lot of ones where they like look at uh, yeah, how the capsids come together. They, they're able to look even at the envelope structure using cryo-EM and like by taking little slices, like if you think about like taking slices right at the curvature of something, <laughs> you'll be able to see like quite a bit of like first you'll see the outside layer, but then as you dive into it, like you'll see more and more. Um, yeah, so they find like DNA MT capsids, which are the ones without DNA and they got like the areas where, where it's full and they kind of like Using these images, they try and pick pick out the life cycle of the of these like different viruses. So they find like the different ratios that they are at different stages of infection. So mm -hmm. like you find out like when the actual like what steps each kind of version of the virus is at. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they, the they, fact yeah. that just the discovery of like that they start empty and then they go into full. And then they get filled up. That actually does give us like a little bit more because I'm not sure if that's the same. Oh yeah, actually no. That the DNA phages do that too, right? They make the, the, they the capsids get assembled and then they're loaded uh, concurrently with trans trans translation, not translation, transcription of the, yeah. the genome or DNA replication. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so the, yeah, there's. A different so this megavirus comes in like all these different forms inside the cell, and yeah, they do a lot of like imaging to put put try and put this puzzle together. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the the mechanism they they find is uh, essentially like what you what we've just been talking about. Yeah, but they, 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 yeah. things get loaded in to the preformed <laughs> the preformed uh, capsids. Yeah, and then like at the end. All these types of particles are released, so um, you get some. Em so I guess you get some empty things as mm. well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I'm not sure, like, what the whether there's much function, whether there's specific functionality in that, or whether it might be an artifact of this system, or who knows. Yeah. But it's still very interesting to see that because again, this is not something we haven't seen before, mm -hmm. uh, like in this virus at least. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, people, we don't we don't really have. Uh, we've never tried to. I mean, this this, I, this is just like I guess how a, sci a scientist, biotech sort of person might think is like you've never tried to like exploit this particular virus for for some like technological means, mm. um, and like understanding yeah. it better kind of like draws you down that line. Like already, I'm thinking, oh, some are partially full, some are like empty. Like I wonder whether or not like you could fill the empty things, you could harvest the empty things, and like you could just use the empties as like something useful. Um, well, yeah, we've seen that with biomolecular condensates, right? Where mm -hmm. some people created artificial, like, kind of organelles out of virus pieces. Yes, that's right. Uh, mm -hmm. And here's what we, here we can essentially do that with, like, the first stage where you're creating the empty yep. capsids. Yeah. And then these are bigger, maybe. Yeah. They might be bigger than those particular yeah. Yeah, micro compartments or na nano I mean, compartments. Yeah. Is that what they're called? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, nano compartments. Mm -hmm. But yeah, these are giant viruses, so the potential for creating really giant compartments could be quite useful. <laughs> uh -huh. I actually don't know what the size is between the two. Do you, do you recall off the top of my head? I don't yeah. recall off the top of my head. <laughs> I, don't recall. I just heard them say like giant viruses. Yeah. And because like giant viruses, but nano compartments. I not. I actually don't. <laughs> they're not on the same scale. I'm not sure which ones, which ones bigger, which ones smaller. Yeah, I mean, I guess like, I mean, it depends on how 
because giant viruses can come in all sorts of sizes, I think. <laughs> right, uh, but right. Okay, but I, that, still, I, I feel I, like... I just threw it out there. <laughs> let's move on. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> next one. Phage infection restores PQS signaling and enhances growth of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, last eye quorum sensing mutant. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I guess... Uh, Another uh, another story in the archive of really complicated like phage bacteria interactions. Um, in this case, they're talking about uh, I think more about the relation between phage and bacteria. Um, if we go to Figure One, I think that this is like just like the most curious observation that sort of kicks all of this off is they have um a particular pseudomonas they, they evolved a phage that had a weird behavior because like they, they want to study it uh a weird behavior is specifically in relation to quorum sensing systems and so typically this virus when uh in d typically this virus when it's treated on a lawn of uh pseudomonas it's going to make plaques right that's the classic way viruses work right it like will clear off a little bit of space that's where the virus is replicating and, and causing lysis but strangely enough, in a, in a mutant bacteria that has a, a specific mutation in its quorum sensing system, those viruses actually end up making colonies or like not colonies because it's a lawn of bacteria. Right. So it's just like the, the bacteria lawn gets thicker in certain areas and raises above that lawn. <laughs> so it's a, it's a virus that makes um, so bacteria like, grow more. Yeah, grow grow more. And of course, like this is a complicated, this is a really complicated phenotype to identify because like this is a lawn of bacteria. Like there's evolution that's happening in there, right? Like there's many events that's happening to make that that colony grow up. Like there could be death and and extra mm -hmm. growth, right? Like it doesn't have to be like just like they make it grow more. Um, and in fact, like there is some complicated interplay that they try to disentangle in this paper between like increasing lysis, uh, autolysis within the cells, which then ends up selecting for certain right bacteria in that population that do have different features. Um, and that and that's what's giving us that that's what they sort of tie up the story at the end um, as as to why these these appear. So yeah, so the paper is actually quite there's um there's a lot I think to it in terms of like the way that they build up the story. Um, and uh, one thing that I think we can go to that is useful is there's one point where they look at the gene expression. Um, a sorry, one second. <clears throat> Figure five A. <clears throat> So in, in figure 5A, like they they go in and they look at like some of the, the gene expression that's happening inside of uh, this last eyed mutant, uh, if it's if it's infected or it's uninfected. And again, I don't think this is an easy <laughs> figure to look at necessarily. Like I just want to pick out like the um, I guess it's like the middle gray and the uh, second lightest gray, right? So that's like the mutant that's uninfected plus the mutant that has uh, been infected by this strange, um, yeah, this strange uh, phage that they've selected for. And then the different transcripts that are at the bottom, these are all different quorum sensing um, systems. Right. Uh, either, either part of the same system that last eye is on or like downstream of that system. And what they find is that on inf infection with this strange phage, like they do get upregulation of some of the downstream um, like regulatory uh, molecules. So in it, the phage infection is um, is allowing like a bypass of the the mutation in the quorum sensing right. system and turning it on in a certain way. Uh, and they link that. Uh, I, I, I don't know what figure they do it, but like I'm just. Mm as I was reading through the discussion, they were saying they link that to the ability for quorum sensing to activate Cas9, actually. And so um, so what's happening is, again, this is the hypothesis based on some of the data they brought together, is that the 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 phage is like uh, increasing the ability for these bacteria to fight off their infection, right? It's, inducing their immunity essentially right. so then they 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 undergo a process of lysing for a while but uh that that leaves uh a, a population of bacteria that now um are able to gr grow better because of uh 
maybe they they now have the cast right because like mm. that immunity from cast like it's it might come from sort of having some light lysed brethren around right then you can pick up some of those molecules and you can turn that into your own immunity and then be able to grow in a certain scenario um yeah and they also so they also show though so so what's interesting about this and what makes this relevant, I guess, to therapeutics or what, why they want to talk about it in the realm of therapeutics is with phage therapy. So like uh, you want to be able to use phage therapy against um, some of these pseudomonas, like especially within cystic fibrosis, there's like antibiotic resistance that's going on. But uh, here the suggestion is that you could turn on certain gene clusters with phage therapy um, and that might be really beneficial for the bacterial growth <laughs> in, in sort of like the collective mm -hmm. yeah and really ba bad for the uh, other th because uh i think there is an, uh, an issue like in well, in like some areas where you can get phages that activate virulence genes that are like similar yeah. to these growth genes and so you give someone phage therapy and suddenly the bacteria turn into this hypervirulent they start doing a lot more like toxins and stuff so you don't yeah. want that in phages but you need because you don't want it you want to understand how that can happen and so exactly this paper exactly is looking at that exactly um they they also they bring up this example that inside of the like, cystic fibrosis patients who get infected by pseudomonas that's a really common like makes lots of biofilm and like colonizes the lungs um in that scenario they often find mutants of quorum sensing systems because they just don't need to sense anymore. Like they're kind of settled into their 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 system, but that actually mirrors this type of mutant here. So like it would say that then a phage that's trying to destroy those particular bacteria may end up like activating certain things in them, right? Reactivating quorum sensing systems that then increase virulence. Um, so yeah, uh, it's a it's a kind of it's a very complicated story. I, I don't think I grasped all of it just by like going through of it through it, uh, going through figure by figure yeah. uh, before this. But uh, but I do think it has like really interesting um, implications in terms of like uh, understanding how the quorum system quorum sensing systems interact together and what happens when they get stressed out by like a phage, right? And the the ways that those networks can adapt. Yeah, I think that, that I mean. Yeah, mm -hmm. because like bacteria have to like cope with a number of phages and have to adapt to them because phages don't always yep. kill the host. Sometimes they just go lysogenic or just hang out. And so understanding how mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. can affect, I mean, because I know there was like a theory a couple of years ago that some hypervirulent versions of bacteria were uh, hypervirulent because of a phage that was happening. And that, that what we thought was an, a, a bacterial outbreak might have been a phage outbreak in those bacteria that caused them to turn hypervirulent. Um, yeah, absolutely. And and to remember, too, in this context, that bacteria themselves are picking up <laughs> mutations, right? That like that then would prime them to respond different ways to, to phage. Um, that's like another important component, I think, of, of this particular story and, and thinking about phage therapy in general. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, it, and, and it's not like this is like the first time it's thought about, right? And even not the first time we thought about it, because I'm pretty sure the last time we talked about phage therapy, we were talking about trying to just align the evolutionary incentives so that like the evolution the bacteria wants to do is going to be like more antibiotic sensitive or like less virulent. Mm -hmm. So like there are also ways of using these same principles to try to get what we want out of it. But, you know, I, yeah the world is a big place and like it's quite complicated to crack that nut and understand it like sort of like from an engineering perspective and so like there is some time needed to be spent to just understand how's the system work as it is right because like it wasn't engineered just for us right we want to you know deploy technologies with it but like uh, so, some of the nuances we don't even uh, fully understand yet <laughs> yeah i think that that's a really because the end goal of that would be really interesting because i remember really like at this conference ages and ages ago scientists said that the goal isn't so much to exterminate back like bad bacteria but to learn to <laughs> find ways to make them cooperate with us so turning yeah bacteria that produce <laughs> to the other end into things that are more benign that can just hang out because a lot of them are just parts of our microbiome that have just gone a bit crazy and you want to rein them in mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, I guess we should move on. Awesome. Let's let's yeah, let's move on. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so last, last paper we have for you today uh, is characterization of engineered mucus and microenvironment for in vitro modeling of host microbe interactions. So in some ways, very straightforward, <laughs> making a new model. But of course, a lot of work goes into making a new model, uh, lots of troubleshooting and figuring out the best ways. Um, but the reason that we need such a model is because uh, mucus is super important. <laughs> it, it changes the way Zebra. that things can diffuse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it changes the way things... We're, we're, we're definitely full of it. <laughs> um, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, Me specifically. It, <laughs> uh, changes the way things diffuse. And so, like molecules that bacteria make diffuse differently. Um, injury signals that the cells are responding to, right, are diffusing differently through the mucus. Um, so, one of the technological things that they were able to do here is they specifically make like a alginate mucin uh, matrix that's cross linked by calcium. And uh, that's was it was mucin is like the mucus that we have. Alginate is kind of not. It's um, actually made by a bacteria, <laughs> um, uh, but they use the properties of it in order to gel it uh, quickly over the living cells because that was actually that's one of the challenges, sort of technical challenges in this um, paper is that like you want to use mucin because that's our mucus, but mucin doesn't gel really well outside of the body, <laughs> uh, outside of its context. So they kind of like hack together something that has the properties of mucus in terms of its diffusion of rate and stuff like that but you know some of the sugars aren't perfect uh, in this mucus that they make but it does um, it does uh, serve as a diffusive barrier and when these uh, models are treated with pseudomonas uh, or shigella I think is the two um, that they use that's just if you scroll down a little bit these are the yep. two yeah either shigella or pseudomonas, they do behave really differently. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like they grow really differently in the mucus versus in just regular culture medium. Uh, so like there is, base, there, what that's telling us is a very promising thing for the model is that the model is teasing out something different, <laughs> mm. uh, different behavior from these bacteria, perhaps a behavior that is more contextually relevant <laughs> to uh, a mucosal surface than what we see in just like Infecting a cell culture model. Yeah, yeah, a strict, uh, like a straightforward cell. Very culture important model. for thinking about like things like the respiratory medium, or, like which pre which we're more familiar with mucus, but also like the gut has loads of mucus in it, and yeah, like, absolutely, that's really important <laughs> for the gut microbiome. You've got like bacteria that live off of the mucus we create, and mm -hmm. and also like but get bacteria that produce stuff that is detected by the, our immune system, and so mm -hmm. like stuff models like this are quite important for understanding like that kind of three-dimensional structure of those sorts right. of those uh cultures of those communities so what this won't be able to tell us is like mucus we, we talked about before mucus has like specific carbohydrates and like like carbohydrate moieties and like structural conformations that could induce different signaling events in bacteria and in cells this mucus doesn't quite do that like it might have some of it but it doesn't have all of it for sure but it does definitely provide the diffusive barrier right that mm. things like are going to diffuse really differently through it um and yeah they yeah. they spend a lot of time characterizing that for us right the way in which like bacteria have different access to these cells so they don't kill them as quickly right um uh yeah i, I think yeah. that's the biggest thing actually that they the biggest takeaway right is that having mucus there it means that some like virulence factors and stuff that would kill off cells like it just takes longer to get to places but that means those cells have time to also change their signaling in response and so that we're capturing a really different moment in the model than we would be um otherwise yeah yeah very very interesting i think that does bring us to the end of our show um yeah yeah absolutely um so uh, join us next week for more cool microbiology news. <laughs> yeah, and we want to remind everyone that while we're very passionate and enthusiastic about microbiology and somewhat qualified, we, it's possible we didn't get everything right. Science is about thinking critically and asking the right questions. So if you have any questions or corrections, please, please let us know in the comments. Yep, I totally agree. You can reach out to us over Twitter at microTWJC. We both believe that peer review is a process and that we can all participate in it. So we hope that you've had a good time listening to us ramble on about microbiology today. And if you have something, uh, found something unclear or have something to add, just let us know in the comments. <laughs> yeah, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, Danny. And thank you so much to all of our commenters and all the people who watch.
Absolutely. See you, Faz. Uh, yeah, and remember, tune in next week for more microbiology content. Goodbye. Goodbye.